Hey CS Dojo, it's YK here. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what dynamic programming is and how to use it. And as I explain how it works, I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with recursion. So what is dynamic programming exactly? It's actually fairly simple, even though it might sound difficult. It's basically a way of making your algorithm more efficient by storing some of the intermediate results. And it works really well when your algorithm has a lot of repetitive computations so that you don't have to repeat those computations over and over again. And I'm gonna give you a concrete example of how it works with Fibonacci sequence. So just in case you're not familiar with it, Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of numbers that starts with two ones at the beginning. And each number after that is computed by adding up the two previous numbers. So the third Fibonacci number is two because one plus one equals two. And then the fourth Fibonacci number is three because one plus two equals three and so on. And this sequence keeps on going forever. So let's say we're trying to solve the problem of finding the nth Fibonacci number or writing a function called fib of n, which takes a positive integer n and finds and returns the nth Fibonacci number. So if the given n is three, we wanna be able to find and return the third Fibonacci number, which is two. And if the given n is five, we wanna be able to return the fifth Fibonacci number, which is five. Let's see how we can solve this problem using dynamic programming. So if you want to solve a problem using dynamic programming, there are typically three steps you can take. The first step is to come up with a recursive solution to your problem. And then in your recursive solution, if you notice that there are a lot of repeated computations, you can then store some of the intermediate results so that you don't have to repeat those computations. This process is also called memoization or memoize. And this is not to be confused with memorize. And I've made that mistake before too. And then the third step, if you don't like using recursion anymore, is to come up with something called a bottom-up approach. So let's first see what a recursive solution might look like for this particular problem. So as I said earlier, we're going to write a function called fib of n, which takes n a positive integer and returns the nth Fibonacci number. And if n is equal to one or two, we know that the first and the second Fibonacci numbers are one, we're going to return one. But instead of returning it right away, we're gonna store it in a temporary variable called the result and then return that instead. And it's gonna be clear why we need to do that later. And if n is neither one nor two, then we're going to return the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers instead. Fib of n minus one plus Fib of n minus two, store that in result and then return it at the end. So the solution works, but it's very, very inefficient. To see why, let's see an example where we are trying to find the fifth Fibonacci number by calling Fib of five. So to find the return value of Fib of five, we need to first compute the return values for Fib of four and Fib of three so we can add them up. And to find Fib of four, we need to first compute Fib of three and Fib of two and so on. And that's what this diagram shows. And looking at this diagram, you might notice that there are some competitions that we repeat over and over again. For example, we need to compute the return value for FIB2 three times, and we need to compute the return value for FIB3 twice here. And it's not a big deal when we are trying to find the fifth or sixth Fibonacci number, but if we're trying to find the hundredth Fibonacci number, it becomes an issue. And actually, the time it takes to find the nth Fibonacci number grows exponentially, or roughly in the order of two to the power of n. And dynamic programming here says, why not just store those return values? For example, for Fib of three, store the return value once we compute it, and then use that same value when we see Fib of three again, instead of computing it again. And again, this process is called memoization. So let's see what a memoized solution looks like in code. Let's again consider the example where we're trying to find the fifth Fibonacci number by calling Fib of five. The idea of this solution is going to be that we're going to use an array whose length is n plus one or six in this particular case because n here is five. And then we're going to store the return value 
for the function fib of n at the index n. So we're going to store fib of 1, which is the first Fibonacci number right here at index 1, and then fib of 2 at index 2, and so on. And initially, we're going to set all these values to null. And we're going to write our function fib, and this is going to take two arguments instead of just one. The first one is the same as before, n, a positive integer, and the second one is going to be this array. And so you'll need to initialize this array memo before you call this function. Now at the beginning of this function, check if memo at index n is null or not. If it's not equal to null, that'll mean that we've already seen this argument n, and we've already stored the return value for that at the index n in memo, so just return that instead. So return memo square brackets n. Otherwise, the following part is the same as before. If n is equal to 1 or 2, return 1, store 1 in result, and then return that at the end. And if that's not the case, then find the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers, and then return that instead. And then what's new in this function is that before you return this result, the return value, you need to store it in memo at index n so that you can use it later. And let's now think about the time complexity for this solution. We're going to call it t of n. This is going to be the time it takes to find the nth Fibonacci number with this particular method. And we're going to find that by multiplying the number of times we call this function, fib, with the time it takes to execute each of those calls. We're going to call that t. Now, there are only two ways we're going to call this function fib. The first way is when we call this function for the first time with the arguments n and memo to find the nth Fibonacci number. And the second way is from this line right here. And notice that if you look at this whole block after this first if clause, this whole block is only executed at most n times. And this is true because there are n possible arguments to this function. That's 1 through n. And each time this function is called with each of those arguments, the return value will be stored in memo at index n. So after the first time this function is called with each argument, we'll never get to this block. And each time this block is executed, fib is called at most twice if we get to this line. So the number of times fib is called is at most two times n plus one. So two n comes from this block right here, and one comes from the first time we call this function fib. And the time it takes to execute each of those calls, this t right here, is going to be a constant time, or a big O of one. And this is because if you look at each operation in this function, excluding these recursive calls that follow, each operation is a constant time operation. And when you have a constant time operation, when you add them up, you still get a constant time operation, which is big O of 1. And that's why we have big O of 1 here. And so t of n, or the time it takes to find the nth Fibonacci number with this particular method, is going to be 2n plus 1 times big O of 1, which is big O of 2n plus 1, which is equal to big O of n. And this is a huge improvement from what we had earlier, which was big O of 2 to the power of n. And let's now examine how this memo array is actually filled. So let's say we're trying to find the fifth Fibonacci number again. And when we call fib with the argument 5 and memo, of course, we'll see that we don't have a stored value at the index 5 yet. So we go down and we're going to ask ourselves what's the value of fib of 4 and then 3 and so on. And when we get to fib of 2, we'll know that this value is 1. So we're going to store it at index 2 right here. 
and same with pivot one, that's one right here. And once we have these two values, we'll be able to find the third Fibonacci number, which is pivot three right here. And then once we find the value by adding them up, store that value right here so we can use it later. And then when we go up to pivot four, we'll add one and two right here and we get three and so on until we get here. And so as you can see, this array is mostly filled from left to right. So when you see this, you might say, why not just explicitly build this array from left to right from scratch instead of building it recursively? And that's the idea behind a bottom-up approach. So let's see what a bottom-up approach might look like in code. We're going to define a function called fib bottom up, which takes n a positive integer just like before and returns the nth Fibonacci number. And then if n is equal to one or two, of course, we're going to return one. And after that, we're going to define an array whose length is going to be n plus one, where n plus one is six, of course, if we're trying to find the fifth Fibonacci number right here, if n is equal to five. And after that, we're going to set the first and the second elements of this array bottom up to be one, these two items right here. And then we're going to run a for loop for i from three, which corresponds to this item right here, up to n, and n corresponds to the last item right here of this array. And whatever index we're examining currently, we're going to set that element at the index i, or bottom up square brackets i, to be the sum of the two previous items. So in this particular example, we'll have two here, three here, and after that, we're going to return the last item in bottom up or bottom up square brackets n, and we're done. The time complexity for this algorithm will be again, big O of n, because we're going to define this array and go through this array only once. Okay, so that's how dynamic programming works. But now I'm gonna show you a quick demo with Python and something called Jupyter Notebook to show you how this idea might play out in practice. So in this Jupyter Notebook, I have defined a few functions in Python. Fib of n, which is a recursive, naive recursive solution, and fib of memo and fib of two, which represent a memoized solution, and fib bottom up, which is of course a bottom up solution. So let's see how they compare to each other in performance. We're gonna try running fib of n first, the naive recursive solution with fib of five, and that gives us five, which is expected. What about fib of 20? That gives us the answer pretty quickly too. And what about fib of 35? This actually takes five to six seconds on my computer. So it's obviously not the most efficient approach. Let's see how fib of two and fib of memo, the memoized solution compares to that. Let's try running fib memo of five first, and that gives us five, which is expected. And what about fib memo 35? That's pretty quick too. And what about fib memo 100 and 1000? This actually gives us an error, and this error is called the recursion error. Python gives us this error actually because there are too many recursive calls on a call stack. And to fix that, we can just use the bottom-up approach. One advantage of using a bottom-up approach is that we don't have to put any recursive calls on a call stack. So we don't have to worry about that. So we're going to load this function and then run it with the argument 35, which is pretty quick, 1000. And then let's try 10,000 as well. And that's pretty instantaneous too. Okay, so that's my introduction to dynamic programming. Let me know in the comment section below what you thought of this video. And if you have any requests about what kind of videos I should make in the future, let me know in the comment section below as well. I'm YK from CS Dojo and I'll see you in the next video.